Welcome to Mount Calvary. My name is Eric. We begin our service in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Lord and Savior was given to die on the cross for our sins, and so let us pause and confess our sins before him. Father in heaven, we thank you for your great grace that you sent your Son, Jesus, to be our Savior, that he died on the cross for our sins, and that he rose again to give us life. We ask for forgiveness In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his son to die for you, and for his sake he forgives you all of your sins. Go in peace and joy, and let us sing to the Lord.
first lesson is from Psalm 67. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face to shine upon us so that your way may be known on earth, your saving power among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you are judge, for you judge the peoples with equity and guide the nations upon the earth. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. The earth has yielded its increase. God our God shall bless us. God shall bless us. Let all the ends of the earth fear him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The gospel lesson for today comes from Luke chapter 23. Two others were criminals, were led away to be put to death with him. And when they came to the place that is called the skull, there they crucified him, the criminals, one on his right, one on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they cast lots to divide his garments. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Thanks for joining us today. We're in a brand new sermon series called Faith Tune Up. You know, faith is like your car, and in your car, you have check engine lights that turn on. Uh, you've got accidents that might come up. You have sounds that come up in your car, and if you do not pay attention to them, you know, you could be broken down on the side of the road, or in, worse, in a car accident. No one wants anything like that. So over the course of the next five weeks, we're going to take a look at uh, the notion of grace. So how would you define grace? What would you say grace is? Over the next five weeks, we're going to take a look at how grace is defined. Because to be honest with you, grace is incredibly vast. And God's grace is incredibly beautiful. And it's bigger than we can ever ask or imagine. Now, if you're familiar with Christianity, most Christians understand grace as displayed as Jesus dying on the cross for the sins of the world. And that is so true. That is definitely a full measure of grace. But grace even goes beyond the cross, after the cross and before the cross. And we're going to take a look at that over the next several weeks. And we're going to give you a faith tune-up. Now, with any tune-up, uh, if you're going to the garage, you need to learn a little bit uh, about tools. So we're going to do a little tool test today with you. So we're going to show you an image of a tool a picture of a tool, and we need you to keep track of naming that tool and see how you do at the end of this test. There'll be five different tools, uh, five different images, and we'll see how you go. So here's the first one. What is this tool? It is a screwdriver, yes. And the next one, what is this tool? A little harder. It is a wrench. Third picture. What is this tool or these tools? It is a ratchet and socket set. Yes. Next one, a little bit harder. Fourth picture. What is this? This silver thing is an air impact wrench. So it's an even stronger wrench. And uh, finally, the fifth picture here. What do you see here? It is a multi-purpose tool, that's right. How do you do? Did you get one out of five, three out of five, five out of five? Did you get them all right? Well, we're gonna take a look at the notion of grace and how grace is this multifaceted tool. It's often overlooked. In fact, grace is a tool that you go to over and over and over again to tune up your faith. And we're gonna take a look at that over the next several weeks. It's much like the multifaceted, the multi-purpose tool that we showed on the screen just a second ago. Uh, the the multi-purpose tool has got many things that it can do. It's got a Phillips head screwdriver, a straight blade screwdriver, a can opener. It's got a little saw on it. Uh, it. It can unscrew things and tighten things up. It's also got a knife and some scissors. So it's one tool that can do many different things in the same way. God's grace through Jesus Christ is a multi-purpose tool. And the way you tune up your faith is to return to God's grace over and over and over again. Better yet, God's grace comes to you over and over and over again. So God's posture towards us is one of demonstrating grace. His favor is upon us. And in the book of, uh, 
of John, we see the Apostle John describing who Jesus is. And we're going to take a look at it in John chapter 1, verses 14 and 16. This is how the Apostle John describes the grace of Jesus Christ. He describes it in this way. The Word of God became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace, circle that word grace in your mind, full of grace and truth. In His fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. So let's center our attention on that last phrase there, grace upon grace. What is that? Well, Jesus is immeasurable grace. He not only gives us his grace upon the cross, but we're going to see over the next several weeks how God's grace is completely immeasurable. It is grace upon grace upon grace. See, the aspects of grace are, are, are enormous. Now, most of us, if we were to describe God's grace, we might be able to describe one or maybe two aspects of grace. If you could describe grace in just two ways, well, that's kind of like being a mechanic who only knows two tools, the hammer and the screwdriver. Let's say your car was broken down on the side of the road. How useful would the hammer and the screwdriver be to fix your car? It'd be extremely limited, wouldn't it? You don't go to your mechanic and drop off your car and, and ask them, uh, how many tools do you know how to use? And the mechanic says, well, I only know how to use two, just the hammer and the screwdriver. You wouldn't leave your car with that mechanic. Now, in a similar way, to tune up our faith, we need to return to grace over and over and over again. And so today we're going to take a look at just one aspect of grace. We're going to take a look at grace displayed to us on the cross. And that's really the starting point of grace is Jesus' death on the cross for the sins of the world. That's where we can see grace on full display. You see, grace is bigger than you realize. Let's say we take a candle, like a candle that I have before me. The big tall one is called the Christ candle. Now, the Christ candle could have, oh, a million or a billion candles lit off of it. And these billion candles could be lit, but it did not diminish the light from the one large Christ candle. See, the billion of candles of light did not change the fact that this one Christ candle is still lit and still illuminating the world around us. In a similar way, God's grace doesn't run out. It doesn't uh, diminish in light. But in fact, Christ himself can illuminate a billion worlds. He came here to earth to illuminate our world with his grace and his love. Theologian Martin Luther described God's grace as a fountain, a fountain that doesn't run dry. Uh, he described it as a fountain that even the whole world, if it was to draw from this fountain and people were to turn into angels, he says, uh, this fountain would constantly overflow and not even a single drop would be uh, dry up from it. This fountain constantly overflows with sheer grace. Whoever wishes to receive Christ's grace, no one is excluded. Let him come and receive it. You will never drain this fountain of living water. It will never run dry. So just like a candle that lights other candles, it doesn't diminish its light. Jesus is this living water that doesn't run out for you and me. His grace continues to overflow over and over and over again. And that's why Jesus, as the Apostle John describes him, is grace upon grace for you. Now let me turn to a question for you today. Where do you need God's grace? Let's say you're a Vietnam veteran, and it's been decades since the Vietnam War, but you are still experiencing trauma and hardship and pain from that season in life. Where do you need God's fountain of grace to pour into your life. Let's say for a moment you experience a hardship and you're finding it really hard to get through it. Where do you need God's fountain of grace to pour into your soul? Let's say that you're unemployed right now and you're seeking new employment. You need God's fountain of grace for provision for you. You need him to provide for you it's not that your job is bad, but you know that you can serve in such a better way. And so you're desperately seeking for God to provide a better job for you. You need God's grace of provision for you. That might be another aspect of God's grace for you. Or maybe over the course of the pandemic, your faith has dried out. 
it's really dry and you need God's fountain of grace to be poured over you so that your faith will flourish and bloom again. See, God's grace comes in a multitude of different ways. But today we're just going to ask, focus on one aspect of God's grace, and that's his grace through the cross. His grace is for you. It's the one thing that you need to tune up your faith. So this one aspect of grace is, is so important because the truth be told, all of us experience fender benders in life. If you're driving a car and you're hit by someone, you know what a fender bender can feel like. It dents your car, it impacts uh, your life in a serious way. Or if you collide into someone else, you may have hurt them and harmed them in some serious way. A fender bender is something very serious if you're driving a car. In a similar way, in your physical life and in your spiritual life, you too have probably experienced some sort of fender bender where someone said something or did something to you that hurt you and it's left a mark. You're, you're bruised and you're hurt by it. You've got dings all over your life because of, uh, of bumping into guardrails. Now, when that happens in everyday life, you're traveling down the road, what do you do about it? Well, for some people, there's nothing that can be done about it, they feel. They feel totally stuck. And that's why you need a faith tune-up. That's why you need to receive God's grace. You may not even know exactly how you got into this place, but you know one thing for sure, that things aren't right in your heart and your soul and that you need God's grace. And that takes us to a moment on God's fr Good Friday, God's Friday, uh, where there were two criminals who were on the cross next to Jesus, one on his left and one on his right. And the two criminals were having a very serious conversation with one another. One of the criminals was pleading with Jesus, demanding Jesus to save himself, in other words, Jesus, to save himself, and also for Jesus to save the criminals that were on the cross. This criminal, who deserved to be on the cross, was making demands of Jesus and railing at Jesus. The second criminal rebuked this first criminal. The second man knew that he was getting what his deeds deserved, but he also recognized that Jesus had done absolutely nothing wrong, that Jesus was not guilty. He was innocent and yet dying on the cross next to him, just like a criminal. And Jesus reminded this man that, uh, that he would spend paradise with him. Both criminals had the same sentence but both had the same kind of fender bender. They were both dying on the cross, their own cross, for their punishment. And Luke describes what happens in this way, in Luke 23, starting at the 32nd verse. Two others who were criminals were led away to be put to death with him. And when they came to the place that is called the skull, they were crucified with him. And the criminals, one on his right and one on his left, Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do, and they cast lots to divide his garments. From the cross, Jesus, who is full of grace, grace upon grace, prays to his Father that the Father in heaven would forgive them, for they know not what they do. Even upon the cross, Jesus is pleading for God's grace to be upon people. See, when you hurt someone and you realize that you, you, you may ask for forgiveness, but sometimes there's absolutely nothing you can do because in moments like that, you know you cannot do anything to make it right again. In those moments, the only source that you have is for the other person to forgive you, to absolve you, despite you and what you've done. This is where the experience of grace begins. And this is where Jesus pours out his grace. He shows us that God doesn't give us what we deserve. Instead, the cross is a starting point where we learn about God's grace. So these criminals on the cross, they ask for God, uh, for, for Jesus, uh, to take them from the cross. The one rails Jesus. The other one begs Jesus for mercy, that he would be remembered when Jesus comes into his kingdom. So let, let me say it again. Let me ask you this. When Jesus said, Father, forgive them, where did that take place in the story? Did the criminals first come to Jesus, dying on the cross, say, I'm sorry, please forgive me. Now, Jesus, save us. 
and Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do? Or did Jesus first say, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do? And then the conversation between the criminals took place. And Jesus promised the one criminal that he would be in paradise with them. What was the order? Did the criminals first plead with Jesus and then Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do? Or did Jesus say, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do? And then the conversation with the criminals and Jesus took place. See, in our daily lives, we often teach our children to say sorry and then receive forgiveness. So you apologize first and then you receive grace. But what you discover in Luke chapter 23 is that God's grace upon grace moves first. That Jesus is dying on the cross for the sins of the world. And he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they're doing. His grace moves first towards you. And then the conversation between the criminals took place five verses later. See, grace didn't wait for you to say forgiveness, ask for forgiveness. Grace moved first towards you. And that's what's so amazing about grace. God forgives you even before you realize that you need forgiveness. Romans chapter 9 Verse 16, St. Paul describes the grace that we've received from God this way. He says, so then it depends not on the human will or exertion, but on God and his mercy. It doesn't depend on our human will, but only upon God's mercy, fulfilled and revealed in Jesus Christ. Because Jesus is full of grace. He is grace upon grace for you. So let me ask you this. How big is your grace? If you were to draw a box, how large is your box of grace? Is it a small box of grace? A medium-sized box of grace? Or an ever-expanding box of grace? My prayer for you during this sermon series, Faith Tune Up, is that you'll soon discover that grace is bigger than you ever ask or imagine. That God's grace for you is so incredible that it's an incredibly large box that you can't even draw a picture of it. William Taylor was a Christian missionary and evangelist. Uh, In 1849, he was a missionary in California. And then later, he traveled around the world, including down in South America, and started many Christian churches. William Taylor also wrote some uh, remarkable observations about God's grace. This is what he said. He said, the greatest sin you can commit against God is to despair of his grace. But it is of the greatest sin that you can commit against yourself. In other words, God's grace is so vast and so big. Don't withhold yourself from God's grace. God's grace is so big and so amazing that you shouldn't lose hope because God's grace is bigger than your hope. When you lose hope in God's grace, you're completely underestimating how amazing his grace is for you. See, Taylor's suggesting we're really sinning both against God and also against ourselves by underestimating how amazing God's grace is for us. His grace is poured out for you first and foremost today on the cross for you. That there's absolutely no sin, nothing that you've done that could separate your love and his love for you. He loves you that much. But when you say that you don't really need the vastness of God's grace, what you're essentially saying is, I'm going to rob myself from experiencing God's grace. I don't need his grace. I'm not worthy of it. I'm going to rob myself from it. See, that really puts God's grace in quite a very small box for you. So my friend, I encourage you to take a look at Jesus and his amazing grace for you. He loves you so deeply, so profoundly, that he wants to be in relationship with you. In Tim Keller's book, uh, The Prodigal God, he writes an amazing story about two people to uh, demonstrate God's grace and how it transforms lives. Uh, In the acclaimed foreign film, Three Seasons, it's a series of vignettes uh, about uh, post-war Vietnam between two people, 
Uh, the story is of a, a man named Hai, who was a cyclo driver, a bicycle rickshaw. He rode a bicycle as a kind of a, like a taxi driver. And then Lan, a beautiful prostitute. And Lan is living a life so desperate that she's trying to get out of her lifestyle, but prostitution has only left her trapped in this world of despair. Then Han, Han uh, Hai enters his, her life by winning a bicycle race. And he uses that money uh, to buy one night with this woman. And instead of doing anything with this woman, she, he brings uh, Lan to a hotel only to give her a night's of rest. And Hyde simply sits and admires her. The woman is so taken back by this that she doesn't fully understand how, God, how grace works. But this is exactly how grace works. It's Hyde that comes to rescue her from her trouble. It's troubling at first. She can't get her head wrapped around it. But God's grace through high moves first. It begins to transform her, making what seems to be impossible a return to an ordinary life. In a similar way, Christians are transformed as we accept Christ's gift of grace, that he makes the first move towards us. Even when we don't feel worthy, he makes the first move towards us with his grace because Jesus is full of grace, grace upon grace. And he wants you simply to rest in his grace. He's not demanding anything from you, but simply to rest in his grace. I invite you to join us again next week as we explore another aspect of God's amazing grace. Let's pray. Jesus, you display the kind of selfless grace and love that transforms hearts. Your grace is grace upon grace. And it's because we have a gracious Father. And his, his ways of grace are endless. We can't count them. We can't number them. But Lord, help us over the next several weeks to gain a deeper and wider appreciation of your character revealed through your divine grace. The cross is just a starting point for us to see how great your love is for us. Even still, we know there are countless ways to measure your grace and steadfast love for us. Lord, by your word and spirit, remind us of your character of love and grace for our family and friends. Help us to express your love, grace, and salvation through Christ our Lord. And we trust in you as people are transformed, not by might, nor by power, but by your spirit. Lord, we ask for your tender care and strength for Millie, who's experiencing uh, care in hospice. Lord, we ask that you'd improve Dale, June, and Roy's health as they battle cancer. Comfort Brittany and Joan, and bless the days ahead for Betty, who is also in hospice care. Lord God, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are your ways higher than our ways, and your thoughts are higher than our thoughts. Help us when situations in life are difficult to understand. Bring patience to our hearts and souls as we wait for your perfect will and timing through Christ who taught us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you. May the Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen. Amazing grace, how sweet. The sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see so clearly. Hallelujah.
grace like rain falls down on me. Hallelujah, all my stains are washed away. They're washed away. down 